All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the panel on investor protection. Uh, my name is Andrew Wu. I'm an assistant professor of technology and operations and an assistant professor of finance at Ross School of Business. Um, at Ross, and also in collaboration with uh, multiple schools across campus, we have launched multiple fintech initiatives aimed at putting us at the forefront of the innovation. So these range from um, undergraduate to graduate courses and programs on different areas of fintech, um, action-based learning programs that place students directly in fintech startups and incumbents, as well as collaborative research uh, on new technologies and business applications um, with leading industry practitioners. Okay. So, you know, on the consumer side, uh, technology has really brought a dazzling and complex array of new products and technologies on all fronts of a consumer's financial lives, from you know, payment to credit and lending to investment and to financial planning and advisory. And for instance, robo-advisors, you know, the practice of algorithmically generating portfolio allocation advice and that based on the client's uh, financial situation, and risk tolerance, and then automatically executing these advice for a fraction of the fees charged by human advisors, that has become a $100 billion industry last year, and is poised to become a trillion dollar industry in the next five years. Um, you know, after the crypto bubble has burst, now there has been a new generation of financial products, uh, such as stable cryptocurrencies and tokenized equity offerings that are poised to fully digitize a consumer's financial life. But with all that excitement uh, in the last couple of years, people seem to have uh, started to forget the basic core principles of consumer and investor protection. And uh, because all these products come with a slew of unforeseen risks that potentially has huge implications for both the investor themselves and also the market. So uh, today, uh, we have a distinguished panel of experts on uh, consumer and investor protection, and we're going to explore the current regulatory landscape, as well as recent developments in uh, consumer protection, uh, and how new technological innovations affects the complex relationship between the consumers, the investors, the regulators, and also the markets. Um, so for this panel, instead of individual presentations, we're going to go right into a uh, free flow discussion. Uh, I'm going to start by raising some questions uh, to the panel. Uh, we'll go from there, and then uh, we're going to open up to the audience for uh, Q&A. Okay. So um, I guess you know, my first uh, question is that for many of you uh, on the panel, we have been saying you know, for years that the standard of conduct for finance professionals, for investment professionals, is the most important step in, uh, for policymakers could take to improve protections for the average retail uh, consumers and investors. Uh, why, why is this so important? So I'll jump in. I'm Barbara Roper. I'm Director of Investor Protection for the Consumer Federation of America. And I have been working on this issue in one form or another since I joined CFA in 1986. I wrote my first letter on this topic to the SEC in 1999, and I'm sure we're going to get it solved any day now. <laughs> um, if you think about the investment marketplace that's out there, uh, there is, as you say, a, an enormous, I mean, one of the things we do really well is innovate. There's a product for every need you might have, right? Sometimes hundreds or thousands of products for you to choose from to to provide capital uh, growth or um, income or whatever it is your investment goal is. And what we know about most investors is they do not have the financial sophistication to look at those, those available investments and determine which one are the best for them. And during that period, since I, when I started at CFA, there was actually quite a small percentage of the population that invests. It's now the way we fund our retirement. It's the way we fund our children's college education. The investors who are, are, are out in this marketplace are financially unsophisticated, need to make every dollar work, and extremely vulnerable if things go wrong. So what they do is they turn to financial professionals to help them make these choices. And here again, there's good news. 
if you have $100 to invest or a few million, if you want one-time advice about what to do on a rollover or you want comprehensive financial planning and portfolio management, if you want to pay commissions or hourly fees or asset fees or a retainer fee, there is a business model out there with you in mind. But most of the people out there who are competing for your business call themselves financial advisors, market their services as long-term trusted advice dedicated to acting in your best interest. They are either brokers or insurance agents regulated exclusively as uh, salespeople with no obligation to recommend to you the investments that would actually be the best option for you. And even in the area where technically we have a fiduciary duty for investment advisors who are out there, who are supposed to apparently act in your best interest at all times, cannot, uh, cannot disclose or negotiate that, that obligation away. As enforced by the SEC, all they have to do is to disclose to you the ways in which they are not going to act in your best interest, and they have satisfied their fiduciary obligations. So we have a population that is vulnerable, that is using the markets for vitally important purposes, relying on financial professionals who aren't being held to a standard of conduct that is even remotely adequate to provide adequate protection. Can I jump in? <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Hall. I'm uh, the legal director and security specialist for Better Markets. Uh, we're an advocacy group that's been in existence since 2010. And really for much of our early years of advocacy, we were focused on making sure the financial system was stable and could, uh, could avoid another devastating financial crisis like the 2008 nightmare. Uh, but in fact, this issue, to echo a lot of what Barb was saying, uh, really in our minds took on such an immense importance, a kind of gravitational pull, that we got heavily engaged in the DOL's fiduciary duty rule and we're heavily engaged now on the SEC's Reg BI. And uh, I think uh, to, to re recapitulate, it's, it's really about protecting investors in the most fundamental sense uh, aqu across a broad range of product, services, and financial professionals. Uh, but we also see importance in this endeavor because there's a, there's a connection to financial stability. In other words, when large numbers of investors are exploited, that tends to really generate the raw material that can be part and parcel of a financial crisis. In 2008, what was it? It was exploitive predatory behavior uh, among mortgage brokers and mortgage lenders. And, and it, it's important to see that, that the value of investor protection uh, is, is critical in and of itself but it also has a kind of nexus to the rest of the financial world and the financial marketplace. And the other footnote I wanted to add, and, and, and in a way it's, it's sort of discouraging because we have enough of a challenge facing us uh, in terms of, of trying to get the SEC to do a much better job with what is currently a really a terrible rule. Uh, we think it's also important still not to lose sight of the fact that in the end, even a very strong standard has got to be enforceable in a meaningful way. So, so we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the challenges associated with things like mandatory arbitration, uh, loss of access to the court system, we have to keep those in mind and fight on that front as well. So let me jump in with just uh, a, a little bit of data to try to, to bolster what um, you two were just saying. So. You know, consumers, I think, do rightfully think when someone says they're giving them advice, that it's advice, not a sales pitch, right? So sometimes people would say to me, like, well, why do we need to regulate advisors? Like, we don't, you know, you know what you're getting when you go to a used car dealer. And I'm like, well, imagine if used car dealers uh, marketed themselves as transportation advisors. Come to me to figure out the best bus routes or if you can only manage by buying a car. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, so we sort of, that's a laughable idea, but essentially there are financial advisors that that is the, what, they are, what they're basically doing. And so what does that mean? Well, 
Uh, so I didn't introduce myself. I'm Betsy Stevenson, and I was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and Chief Economist at the Department of Labor um, in both capacities um, getting involved in this rule. Um, and when I was at CEA, Jane Doko and I put together a report to try to quantify what was going on in the industry. And I think the thing that really struck me is that really a lower bound of it, uh, estimate is that retirees end up with 5 to 10 percent less savings because of conflicted advice. And I say this is a lower bound estimate because, you know, empirical scholars, we want to show causal effects. So we're not trying to figure out exact, the exact magnitude of the effect. We're trying to show all the places in which we can say for sure conflicted advice causes this loss. And so we get these estimates of 5 to 10 percent. What does that mean for a typical person who's, say, investing over a 30-year uh, period and then going to draw down their retirement assets? They're going to run out of assets about five years earlier. So you mentioned, what does this mean for the overall financial stability? What does this mean for the overall uh, financial stability of the federal government? Who's going to pick up the slack when people run out of retirement assets? Where's the pressure going to be when the baby boomers run out of money? So they're not just taking money from the baby boomers. They're taking money from all of us because I think there's going to be enormous pressure for the federal government to step in and help these folks out when they run out of money. So we all have a vested interest in solving this problem. Hi, uh, my name is Jane Dorgan. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, introduce myself and then also, also um, offer, uh, you know, a, 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 a somewhat different perspective. Um, I'm an assistant vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and so before I even like go any further, I just need to say that my participation in this panel is just <laughs> on behalf of myself as a concerned citizen um, and not on behalf of anyone else. <clears throat> Um, I, I'm, I'm glad, Betsy, that you remember those estimates because they've kind of been buried sort of <laughs> deep in my mind. I've kind of just, um, you know, kind of just have forgotten or uh, have sort of um, buried a lot of um, the work that we did because where we are now with, um, you know, the regulation and sort of thinking about um, investor protections is very different from where we were, um, you know, five years ago and sort of what's happened to, you um, you know, sort of the fate of uh, protecting consumers um, and savers from these conflicts has um, just taken a very sort of depressing toll. So I'm really glad you remember that. <laughs> I guess, um, you know, the other perspective that I bring is, you know, as somebody who's um, worked on household financial decision making and sort of studied how people um, make decisions on behalf of themselves, um, and, and it's not just vulnerable populations that get swindled into, you know, bad investments or, um, you know, complex annuities, you know, where they sneeze and then they lose all their money. Um, I mean, these problems extend to a broad, you know, swath of savers. And, you know, research shows that, you know, there's a lot of complexity in financial markets. Andrew alluded to this earlier when he was sort of describing, you know, that the technological innovations that have changed the landscape for financial advice. And, you know, part of the reason why, um, you know, these estimates of these impacts on savers are so large is that these mistakes that people can make and, um, and, and sort of the, the set of vulnerable people is, is really large. So uh, for those in the audience who hasn't uh, kept up with regulatory updates, uh, there has been a significant change in the regulatory landscape uh, in the investment uh, advisory market. Uh, so basically in 2015, right, so the Department of Labor proposed a really sweeping rule on uh, fiduciary duty, which basically said that as long as you, uh, as a financial advisor, as, as long as you have anything to do with um, financial advisory or retirement planning, uh, these type of activities, you are automatically considered a fiduciary and therefore held uh, for, with, with fiduciary duty. So you're held with a standard that you need to put your client's interests strictly above yours. And it doesn't matter if you're a broker paid on a commission or an insurance agent or a fee-based uh, financial advisor. And uh, so this would obviously have a tremendous impact on the commission-based uh, brokers and advisors who are mostly have been regulated by FINRA and held at a lower standard of uh, suitability, right? But this would also impact the compliance structure of the entire financial advisory industry as a whole. 
you know, as you can expect, the financial industry really fought tooth and nail uh, and against this and after a really protracted uh, series of legal battles. And the rule was essentially vacated by the Fifth Circuit Court um, uh, last year and uh, was expected to be replaced by the SEC's uh, regulation, was called the Regulation Best Interest, which is essentially a weaker version of this uh, and that is expected to be released by the fall. And uh, several of our panelists are actually instrumental in creating this fiduciary rule. So I'd like to hear some of your insights you know, on the creation of this rule and you know, its rationale and its relation for the, um, with, with consumer protection, and in the age, especially in the current age. So yeah. uh, let me start, and then I'll yeah. turn it to, to you guys. But um, first of all, I'm just going to disagree with you that it was a sweeping rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I watched what was happening in a bunch of other countries, in the UK, and Australia, and the Netherlands. Um, their sweeping would be banning commissions. <laughs> that, and uh, what this was trying to do was uh, say, look, you, you can take your commissions, but you're still supposed to have your clients' interests first. So you need to meet a best interest standard. I, you know, to, to really understand where this was coming from, you have to understand how the retirement landscape started changing. So it used to be most people got a defined benefit plan, which meant that their employer offered them some kind of retirement plan, and that retirement plan was essentially a pension that was going to pay them some fixed amount in retirement. They didn't have to worry about the returns. That was their employer's job to worry about the returns because what they were told was the benefit they were getting. In the, starting in the 1970s, we started having these defined contribution plans, 401ks, um, and then they're still tied to people's employers. And so the, that has been the big shift is to 401ks that get rolled over into IRAs. So when you ask, you know, where is this, you know, conflicted advice coming from, my favorite study was a guy who had his money, a secret shopper, who had his money in the federal government's thrift savings plan, which is about the lowest fee plan you could possibly have. The guy calls uh, nine advisors and says, should I roll it into an IRA or just leave it where it is? Eight of the nine said, you definitely need to roll it. <laughs> um, so that, that's the sort of, that is the, the changing landscape. I think DOL, and if you want to know why it's opposed so much by industry, it comes back to that 5 to 10% they're taking out of retirement savers. We estimated that's $17 billion a year. People are going to fight like hell over $17 billion a year. Financial industry doesn't want to give that back to retirees. So it's going to be a tough regulatory nut to crack. But it, DOL didn't go sweeping. What they did was, I thought, very surgically went in and said, here's what we need to do to give people a minimum set of protections that when they are seeking advice, they know at least their best interests are going to be the front of people's mind. Sorry, just to jump in really quickly before, um, Barb, I know you have a lot of interesting <laughs> things to say on this topic. Um, I, mean, I just also want to push back on the idea that it was sweeping. It, it, it's not sweeping because it's, it, it was just you know, targeted at retirement products. Um, you know, lots of people get financial advice for, you know, lots of things that are not related to, 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 to retirement, and um, the, the rule didn't touch that. So I'd just like to say, um, I think what the industry found so threatening about the DOL rule was not the words best interest, but that DOL meant the words best interest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when they, I mean, seriously, I, it's, it sounds like a joke, but it's actually true. FINRA describes their suitability standard as requiring brokers to make recommendations that are consistent with the best interests of their customers and preventing them from placing their own interests ahead of the customers. That's how the SEC describes the Investment Advisor Act fiduciary duty. That's how DOL described its fiduciary standard. And so the words are virtually indistinguishable, but when DOL said best interest, they meant you have to look at what's you have available there and you have to decide which one or ones you think are the best match for the investor. And I remember when I read, it was I think a comment from FINRA, which is not the worst player in this process, but you know, saying they seem to think best interest means best interest, <laughs> best means best, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> that's a concept of the investor. And then the second piece of what DOL did that was so important was they said, yes, you can have your, you can get your commissions. You know, you can get transaction-based payments, 
But this business of sales quotas and sales contests and getting paid 10 times as much to sell this product as that product, you've got to put some serious policies and procedures in place to rein in those conflicts. And you started to see before the rules demise real changes. I mean, we were at the brink of a revolution in the way services were going to be offered to the investing public. Um, we had something called clean shares, which allowed for a transaction-based purchase of mutual funds that where the, the fee was set between the broker and the advisor, you know, and the customer instead of by the mutual fund deciding how much the broker was going to get paid to sell me a mutual fund. So you really started to see some innovative changes taking place to, to wring out some of these excess side conflicts in the broker-dealer business model disappeared in a flash when the, when the rule was overturned. And the same groups that went into court to sue to stop the DOL rule are now champing at the bit to push the SEC rule through, which uses, as I say, virtually identical words, best interest, can't place the broker's interests ahead of the investor's interests, but doesn't mean them. So best interest certainly doesn't mean you have to recommend the best of the available products. The prohibition on placing the broker's interests ahead of the customers doesn't even make it into the safe harbor. You know, it's the chief thing the SEC used to sell their rule, and it doesn't even make it into the safe harbor. And everything else is so vague and undefined that we, it has no concrete meaning, and we've seen how they enforce similar concepts, concepts in the Advisors Act, context and there's no there there. So that's the concern. That's why the, the roles have flipped on the SEC rule. Yeah, and, and there's an interesting legal pers perspective that, that um, comes to bear here, uh, both as to the DOL's uh, rule and as to the SEC's rule. And with respect to the DOL, you know, they were dealing against the backdrop of ERISA, of course, which is famously a strong uh, statute which recognizes the fundamental importance of conferring special protections on retirement assets um, and makes it very clear that there's abundant authority to, to establish a broad fiduciary standard. The, th the thing that I think DOL was facing, and one reason why it perhaps wasn't as sweeping as it could have been, as good as it was, is number one, a year after ERISA was passed in 74, 75 comes along, there's already industry influence that comes to bear, and they put in place a rule which is, which is terrible. It has a complicated array of preconditions before the fiduciary status actually kicks in. It says, in effect, the advice has to be rendered on a regular basis. It has to be the primary basis. Uh, so, so really, for 40 years, what happened was industry's practices and expectations became entrenched. The DOL had to fight against that. The second thing that they were up against, and I, and I think they really deserve credit in particular in the way they handled this, they wanted to confer greater protections for IRA owners. And because of the way uh, ERISA was structured in Title II, which dealt with, with IRA accounts, they didn't have the same plenary authority to act. They, did, they took some very creative steps. I think by all accounts, uh, too creative according to industry and, and, and a three-judge panel in the Fifth Circuit, uh, to, to, to really try to, to fix that gap. Uh, and, and it was an admirable effort. Uh, I, I think we, we can talk later about the lawsuits because there's a lot of interesting observations there. On the SEC front, quickly, uh, it, it's, it's disappointing because in Dodd-Frank, Congress gave the SEC very clear authority to, to establish a broad, strong, and uniform fiduciary standard for investment advisors and broker-dealer reps. And one of the reasons why I think, uh, from our, our perspective, it's so disappointing is that they latched on to the weakest statutory authority on which to predicate their rule. Okay, so following up uh, on that about the SEC rule, right? So, you know, just from both a legal perspective and also from an economic pers perspective, do you think the SEC rule should be, uh, you know, could be improved, you know, uh, from, you know, on these perspectives? And also, you know, say, if you were like the, you know, chief economist at the SEC, uh, what would you do, you know, to make this rule a little bit better, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of investor protection, generally, so. 
So, yeah, I mean, so to Steve's point, I mean, we fundamentally disagree with the approach the SEC took, the legal authority that they used. But what we've, instead of fighting that fight, although I think that makes them vulnerable in court, instead of fighting that fight at this stage of the process, we've tried to engage constructively to say, you say you want to raise the standard of conduct over the existing suitability standard. You say you want to prevent brokers from placing their interests ahead of their customers' interests. Here are the changes you would need to be, make in your rule and, importantly, your interpretation of the rule to achieve that. And so the first one is to, you don't even necessarily have to change the language around the best interest standard, but the interpretation of that standard needs to make clear that it, it, when they say you have to act in the best interest of customers, it means you have to recommend the investments you reasonably believe after a prudent process represent the best of the reasonably available investments, the best match for your investor. It, it should be, you know, if a thousand mutual funds satisfy suitability, best interest should be satisfied by, I don't know, 10 or 20. I mean, there it's never going to be just one perfect investment, but it ought to be a narrowing down of the, the investments. The second is, if you want to prevent brokers from placing their interests ahead of the customers, let's get that into the operational provisions of the role that fully satisfy compliance. And the way to do that is to take what's already the best provision in the rule. One of the things it does is it says brokers would have to have policies and procedures in place that are reasonably designed to mitigate financial conflicts of interest. Reasonably designed to do what? It doesn't say. Um, reasonably designed to prevent the broker from placing its interests in the interests of the associated person ahead of the customers would be a really nice way to incorporate that concept into the operational provisions of the rule and to put some real meat into that mitigation requirement. And then you might see some of these things like the <coughs> sales quotas for the sale of proprietary products or the contests to encourage the sale of a certain category of products or revenue sharing <coughs> payments, you know, getting paid more to push the products that pay the firm more, you know, whatever. You might see some of those conflicts actually reined in as it is industry clearly thinks they're just going to be able to paper over those kind of conflicts without having to make any meaningful change. And then the third one, which is necessary actually to ensure that this rule doesn't weaken existing protections for investors, is that brokers who are in an ongoing duty of trust and confidence with their customers, ongoing relationship of trust and confidence, need to have an ongoing duty to those customers, just as courts have found that they have under the you know, state common law fiduciary standards. So by saying that brokers automatically, absolutely, in every circumstance have no ongoing duty at the end of a transaction, this rule actually weakens one of the fundamental protections that investors now get. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I agree completely with Barb's analysis. Though that's really kind of the, the, the trifecta of what needs to be fixed here. I think hand in hand with that is that this this proposed rule relies much too much on disclosure. This is this mm -hmm. audience is very sophisticated. I think everybody here understands the shortcomings of a disclosure regime when it comes to protecting investors in short and across the board. Uh, it's especially true, and this goes back to the theme we talked about at the beginning. It, it, you know, financial advice is technical. It's complicated. It, it, it's, it's almost to expect disclosure to serve the best interests of an investor who needs in advice is like asking a patient, right, to, to, to uh, basically to educate themselves and then make the, the decisions about what it is that they should do to look after their health. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the asymmetry there is just as astonishing. People don't necessarily think of it that way in finance, but it's true. Uh, and, and then on a, on a you know, it, it, there's a whole s cluster of issues around disclosure, but again, it's, it's mainly excessive reliance on disclosure and it so happens disclosure that hasn't been adequately tested. Uh, the testing that has been done by independent organizations clearly indicates that the disclosure regime that goes along with Reg BI is woefully inadequate. The SEC didn't do its homework before it actually put out the proposal. And it, it, it needs an enormous amount of work there. If I 
I could just um, pick up on the point about disclosure. I mean, I, I completely agree with your characterization of sort of the problems with disclosure. And I mean, as an economist, the idea that um, you would try to address these foundational problems with incentives by using fine print mm -hmm. is so bizarre to me. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and in part, it's because, um, you know, there's all this research that shows that, you know, disclosures often have unintended consequences. If, you know, brokers disclose that they're conflicted, um, you know, that, you know, sometimes leads uh, the people receiving the advice to, to trust them more, not less. Um, I mean, the, um, there have been sort of these independent studies of disclosures on sort of how, you know, on, on sort of like a psychological level, people, um, you know, read, how much time do they spend reading these documents, what information do, the, you know, do they, um, do they uh, retain versus not retain, and, and none of that is like terribly optimistic that it's going to, you know, change, um, you know, uh, investors' behavior. And, and that's really just what's so problematic about the, the disclosure regime is that they're aiming to solve the problem by changing you know, the information that investors get and changing investors' behavior when we have a lot of evidence, um, you know, and Betsy cited it earlier, saying that the problems are not, you know, you know, among people who are trying to save and, you know, work toward a secure retirement, it's, it's, it's on the other side. So uh, let me just uh, add a little bit to what Jane was saying about disclosure, because we're, although we're all in, like, vehement agreement here, um, <laughs> but I think I think that my natural inclination as an economist had always been to think like, well, disclosure, at least it can't hurt. Uh, it turns out that's wrong. <laughs> um, and and the, when we were looking at the DOL rule, I mean, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about disclosure. What would be a disclosure regime that would work? And I became convinced that disclosure is just never going to work here. And bad disclosure could really, really hurt. So how does bad disclosure hurt? Well, it turns out it, studies show that people have a little bit of a moral compass. And that moral compass prevents them from cheating people completely. That's a good thing. But when we give them disclosure, their moral compass gets worse. Because they think, I disclosed. So now their moral compass that's shouting, don't cheat the old guy, isn't shouting as loud anymore. Because hey, you told the old guy what to expect. So the problem is the, the broker dealers themselves are less, uh, less constrained by their own moral compass once we have disclosure. And then on the flip side, the consumers who are getting it are thinking, as Jane mentioned, oh, well, at least he told me. So maybe I can trust him more. And I, I just wanted to circle back to that, that retirement for a lot of people is really stressful. Right. I'm pretty sophisticated, and I still don't like to sit down and think about my retirement planning. And what people want is someone that they can trust that will give them advice, that will just tell them what to do so they can stop thinking about this hard problem. And that trust is a really important part of the relationship. And you can't have it if the person doesn't have your best interests at heart. You should not trust. And I think the only disclosure that I could get behind would be, at the very beginning, the person looking you in the eye and saying, do not trust me. <laughs> Nothing I say is true. <laughs> yeah. Just to follow up on the point of thinking like an economist, you know, in both Betsy and Jane, you spend a lot of time and also energy, right? So economically studying, the understand the uh, nature and also the extent of just the advisory conflict of interest. And that culminated in a, uh, you know, the White House's uh, Council of Economic Advisors report that basically says that, well, the matter is really big. It costs the investors up to $17 billion a year, or one percentage points per year. Uh, so, uh, you know, just SEC also recently put out a series of analysis, economic analysis uh, in support of the Reg BI. So uh, I'm wondering if we get a chance to review that, and, you know, what are your thoughts on this? In particular, you know, given that recently there's uh, 11 economists uh, on a bipartisan basis coming out and wrote a letter that says that pointed out a series of flaws with that uh, econo economic analysis so I'm wondering what your thoughts uh, are on that and could it be improved <laughs> yeah. I mean 
all economics, economic analysis can be improved, and so that's just always a given. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I've spent some time, you know, reading through their analysis, and I would, I would sort of hesitate to call it an analysis, um, and, 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 and because, <laughs> because the basic structure of it was, let's deny the problem exists, and then conclude that the rule has minimal impacts because there is no problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and I'm sorry, like, if this is too reductionist and I'm, like, you know, glossing over some important nuances and complexities, and so you should hold me accountable to it. But that was sort of, like, my takeaway from it. And, and then, you know, I started to think, well, why would a, you know, a federal agency that is, you know, sort of bound by, you know, guidelines and regulations to put forth cost-benefit analysis when it's promulgating, you know, new regulations, um, you know, that considers, you know, the societal, you know, benefits and harms of regulations, like, why would they do something like this? And, 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 the, and the only sort of explanation that I could sort of think of are sort of these, like, you know, political economy challenges, um, you know, within the SEC, um, whereby factual analysis couldn't, you know, inform their policy deliberations. And, and then I just got really depressed. And so, <laughs> um, but, but that, was, that, that was my takeaway of their economic analysis. <laughs> So I think it took like 50 pages of CFA's comment letter to explain all of the things that were wrong with the economic analysis, so I'll spare you that. <laughs> but this letter that Andrew referred to is really extraordinary. The senior economists from the SEC dating back to 1982 submitted a letter to the agency saying, you haven't defined the regulatory problem that you're trying to solve. And here are some issues you haven't considered, like the impact of conflicts of interest on advice. For example, you haven't considered the available economic evidence. I mean, Jane's right. I mean, it, to, to call this an economic analysis applies that there is analysis, and there's not. Um, so. I think when I look for the explanation of why it's so lacking, I think it's because the SEC is very afraid of being sued by SIFMA and not the Trade Association for Broker-Dealer Firms and not at all afraid of being sued by CFA. And so if they were writing a rule that they thought the industry would challenge, they would have had to be far more rigorous. But I think they are complacent in thinking that as long as the brokers are happy with the rule, and believe me, they're happy, <laughs> they don't have any legal risk. Um, I don't think they've adequately weighed the degree to which the advisors are unhappy with the rule, so I think there's still some exposure there. But it is sort of a, a reality of the system is that a, for a group like ours to try to get standing, to sue, to challenge a rule is extraordinarily difficult for the industry to <coughs> challenge a rule they don't like is costly but much easier, and that's what went into that calculation. Right. Yeah, and, and to, like, once again, to, to bring a, a little bit of the more legal perspective, even to the issue of economic analysis, I, I love the way uh, Jane put it. <laughs> it. It really is spot on. Uh, and, if you, and if you look at her points and, and the other uh, points about the shortcomings, they, uh, they don't pass muster under any of the legal tests that govern what an agency has to do to justify its rules on economic grounds. And in the SEC's case, I mean, the, one of the bedrock principles of administrative law, the State Farm case, is an agency has to consider all of the relevant factors. I mean, we're stepping even beyond economic analysis. What's the relevant factor? There's a problem here, and it's huge. And they just, you know, glossed over that. Uh, so right there, you've got a legal issue that's is sort of connected to the so-called economic analysis. Even if you drill down in a more technical level, the securities laws are very specific. They don't require the SEC to conduct a detailed cost-benefit analysis to quantify things, to match them up and balance them. The statutes do require the SEC to do what we call the ECCF analysis, to consider the impact of a rule on uh, efficiency, competition, capital formation. And even under that clear-cut standard, 
the, the agency did a dismal job, and, and the one that stands out, I think we've all talked about this at some point or another, is their competition analysis. What, what's going on with this rule? They're desperately protecting and preserving two different standards for two groups of the advisory industry, the broker dealers and the investment advisors. It's not a, a, a coherent competitive or level playing field. It, it just flies in the face. Uh, of what makes competitive sense. Finally, uh, you know, a little known fact is that in the very section that details the SEC's obligation to do this kind of consideration of economic factors, it says crystal clear, first and above all else, in essence, you have to consider the public interest. And so no matter what the SEC might try to do, even if it were to sort of dot more I's and try to make this thing uh, pass muster under an economic test, what they continue to gloss over is the mountain of evidence that there's immense harm being done, and until they get to that point, they're never going to be able to have the foundation for an adequate rule. So I think the only thing I want to add is just take it back to what did, you know, what, what did we do at CEA? And that was a report that wasn't designed to be a cost-benefit analysis of a rule at all. It was designed to really lay out the problem as the, research, as the research community, independent researchers, had started to identify. There's just a number of papers out there that have found problems with conflicts. And what we were doing was pulling them all together to be able to say, look, there is a coherent problem here. Where does it come from? And we've, we've talked about conflicts, but we haven't really put, you know, nailed down what do we mean. We see excessive churning research documents that because uh, these broker dealers get paid for churning, that people are excessively churned. What does excessive churning mean? It means excessive fees for them, and that's one of the things that eats down, uh, <coughs> eats down people's retirement savings. The other thing is we see people steered into overly complex products because it's harder for them to see the costs that the uh, it, advisor is getting when it's a complex product, right? You can look easily at, you know, a passive mutu uh, indexed mutual fund and see what the fees are. It's much more, it's much harder to tease out what you're paying when it's a complex product. So you see people steered into inappropriate products for them because of the fact that it's going to generate fees uh, for the advisor. And so the, the cost to the person is not just the fees, but the fact that the product's inappropriate. So it's going through systematically and, try, and saying, look, the research shows this is what happens when people get access to conflicted advice. And there's you know, one study that said, what happens when we take conflicted advice away? And we saw people's retirement accounts going up. So we, we brought a lot of evidence to the table that's not the evidence the SEC is interested in right now. <laughs> and, and they were called out on this by the um, 11. They, I think they were, it was the, the chief economist. Was, they yeah. weren't just chief senior economists at, at, at the former senior yeah. economist. They were, they were the chief economists. And they, were, and they were called out on the fact that they didn't bring any of this evidence to bear. Right. And just to be clear, the, the DOL took the excellent analysis that you all did at CEA and further developed it. You know, it's... I said recently that comparing the SEC's economic analysis to the DOL's economic analysis is like comparing a Dick and Jane reader to a PhD dissertation. <laughs> I mean, they're just, they're just night and day. You know, speaking about the CEA report, uh, so even you know, after you, re you release the report, there's almost like immediate industry pushback on, on, that, on, that, uh, on that analysis, right? You know, what was your reaction? Did you um, expect it? You know, what, what is, your, um, is there anything that you learned from this experience? Uh, with the in, all the industry kind of um, uh, follow up with that, uh. Jane, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I guess I think you know, just you know, from the advice that you know, you know, I got from you know Betsy, who had served in government before and sort of had worked on this you know rule over over the years, and others. I think I think we expected some pushback. I think I didn't really um, appreciate the scale of it. And I, I learned, I don't know, after I left government that um, the financial industry spent a healthy seven-figure sum funding research 
that would undermine the report. And that made me feel that I had done something right. <laughs> you forgot the finger quotes around research. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to poke anyone in the eye. <laughs> I, yeah, that, that's a great way to, to put it. I mean, they're, I think it's simple. They're making a lot of money off of people. They want to keep making a lot of money off of people. And I, you know, they are, of course, when, you know, you reveal that the emperor has new, you know, no clothes, <laughs> there's going to be some pushback. That's exactly what we saw. And the, you know, all I, I thought the scale of the pushback meant that we were not wrong by when, uh, in assessing the scale of the problem. And as I said, I think we are at a lower bound on the scale of the problem. And they know that. And that is why when we had very good evidence to come up with a $17 billion number, they needed to fight back and they mm -hmm. needed to try to discredit us. And I don't think that they were successful in that in any way. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So one thing I think that was interesting about that is the reason we had such a focus on the economic analysis and that process at all was because one of the industry's initial tactics to defeat the original DOL proposal is to say you hadn't, they hadn't adequately assessed the economic impact. They needed to do a more detailed economic analysis. And that was one of their um, initial arguments that got the initial proposal withdrawn. I think there's an interesting implication in that for industry and while it, which is that, by definition, if that's the way they want to play this game, every issue will be fought based on how harmful their conduct is for their customers. That will be the public debate. It will be painful for them and ugly. And the, the DOL's analysis held up in court in, in Steve can talk about that in court after court after court until an extreme panel in one court overturned it. But it, it, you know, one of the reasons I think we see such a shoddy analysis out of the SEC is because if they did a decent analysis, they would have to propose a decent rule. Yeah, um, all good points. I, the, uh, my own view is that, that, that the industry was never successful in really laying a glove on, on even that modest 17 billion, right? I mean, that, and, and as a result of that, what they had to do was, was um, resort to uh, a couple of other just deeply misleading mythologies uh, in order to, to really fight back against the DOL's rule. And, and, and variants of those same arguments are being deployed against uh, the SEC, but they, they, they're, they're much more comfortable. So um, there's, there's, the context is different. But in the case of the DOL, uh, I think one of the arguments they deployed to some effect, at least in some audiences, <coughs> was this crazy notion that if this rule is strong, if it's a broad fiduciary standard, you're going to restrict the uh, ability of everyday investors to get affordable investment advice, the, the sort of limiting access. And it's this just extraordinarily kind of perverse way of looking at regulation. You see it in the payday lending context, where payday lenders are, uh, the agency itself now is saying, look, if we have strong underwriting standards in place, then payday lenders will go out of business and people will lose access to credit. I mean, it's a little bit like saying to a, a malnourished, starving person, uh, don't you want some of this rotten, poisonous food? It, it doesn't make sense when you really take a close look at it. The other thing that they did in the DOL context was, was law, and, and this again, still you still hear echoes of it, is that the SEC was the agency that had the expertise, the jurisdictional power to, to deal with this issue and there's, you know, there's half a dozen reasons why that is completely wrong. Congress in ERISA made it crystal clear that the DOL had responsibility for retirement accounts, far more than just securities. Nothing that uh, the, the Dodd-Frank had in it negated that. In fact, it, it reinforced the notion uh, by saying to the SEC, we want to give you greater authority to protect investors with a fiduciary duty. And at the same time, they said nothing about scaling back the authority of the DOL under ERISA. So neither of those arguments are, ever made sense, but in this crazy world, they got traction. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, the, the small saver 
argument just always drove me crazy because it was a, it's essentially the argument that if people knew how much they were actually paying us for this advice, they would stop paying us for this advice, right? And so, okay, maybe <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds like they should stop paying if you think they don't want to. And when and it, once we had done our analysis, I think it made it easier for us to talk about that, that it was that the problem with, for small savers is that they were charging them too much and people were only willing to pay it because the fees were just so hidden. Right. And I'd just like to throw in one side note. The industry groups that went into court to challenge the rule, the basis for their argument was we are not advisors. We are mere salespeople engaged in arm's length commercial sales transactions no different than a car dealer. And the court bought it. When they're not in court trying to defeat effective regulation, they're back to being trusted advisors. And so, I mean, their argument sounds a little less compelling if you say, well, you know, if you, if you pass this rule, you're gonna lose access to biased sales recommendations from a salesperson who has incentives to recommend the products that are most profitable for the firm <laughs> instead of the ones that are best for you. Oh no. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but beyond that, and to get into an issue I think Andrew would like us to talk about, technology has fundamentally changed this equation, not just through the advent of robo-advisors, but by allowing for the automation of a lot of aspects of advice that were once very labor intensive. And so we have a variety of options available in the marketplace now where advice is available under a fiduciary standard at a very low cost to even very low accounts. And so in the unlikely event that the broker dealers, they always, you know, if you, you know, I'll take my ball and go home. You know, in the unlikely event that they would actually abandon this market entirely if you made them act in their customer's best interest, there is a viable alternative out there available to fill that space that would leave investors much better off than they are today. So yes, just to follow up on that point, when the fiduciary rule was first introduced, was first proposed, and it turns out that, not very surprisingly, the robo-advisors were actually the biggest proponents within the financial service industry, right? So their argument is that, well, if we raise the standards, the costs will, you know, will go up. Hey, you know, we're cheap. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, what, do you, what does the panel think? Is, is robo-advisors the response to the cost argument, you know, raised by the broker-dealers? And, you know, what general role does technology have in, in playing this to solve this problem? So I, I think that the challenge is that people like to think that they're unique and they want to have that trusted personal relationship with someone when it comes to retirement. Um, but the, the truth is the typical person has typical retirement needs and therefore is actually well served by low cost um, uh, robo advising. One of the, my favorite commercials I saw for, uh, you know, an advisor shows like a family on TV uh, and you know, they're at their kid's soccer game, they're eating dinner, they're getting ready for work and it's like, you, you know, aren't, uh, you, you know, you're unique, you need unique advice. And I'm like, no, that wasn't unique. Like, that's what we all do. We all have dinner and we all go to work and we all so, like, do some things with our kids. Like, I think you're making the case for robo advice there. <laughs> um, and so they're trying to create this idea that no, no, you don't, you know, you need something special when in reality, like people have actually very similar needs. And what they need is to have as much money as possible in retirement, and low-cost advising can do that. Right. So I would like to say, just from a slightly different perspective, one, point out that it was actually the fiduciary advisory community as a whole. I mean, the, the financial planning com community has for years been allies in the fight to raise the standard of conduct, and groups like the CFP board and whatnot were strong allies in addition to the robos. And I think we made a tactical error by pointing to the robo-advisors. I think they're an important part of the solution, but it made it very easy. I just sat in a hearing in the House Financial Services Committee last week where one of the Republicans, well, I don't know about you, but my mom doesn't want a robot to give them advice, and neither do I, you know? And, and the issue here is not, you know, robo-advisors, as I said, technology has been harnessed by all sorts of advisors to automate portions of what they do so that, you know, maybe the future is not just so much robo-advisors as 
you know, cyborg advisors or whatever, you know, because what you see is in technology being incorporated into practices that are, that include that human contact that people want. The other thing I think where technology really offered a solution on this is people say, well, how am I supposed to, you know, comply with this best interest standard you want? In the wake of the DOL rule, we saw dozens, maybe hundreds of services roll out, jobs created that were then destroyed when the rule was destroyed, but I digress, um, that were designed to aid on this compliance side. You know, not just the advising itself, but how do you compare a 401k plan menu to the available IRA investments and determine which would be the best option for the investor? How do you analyze that and document the basis for your decision? So I think there's a lot of roles for technology to play in this area. Yeah, and I, I think there's, um, in my mind, there's an even larger point. I think this, this is absolutely right. It's, it's an important component of a solution. It's not you know, the end all and be all. What it says to me, it exemplifies the adaptability of the financial services industry. What that really means is that, and, and you can trace this history back to the Great Depression, almost 100 years, uh, a pattern and a practice of resisting regulatory reform by saying the sky will fall, uh, our industry will collapse and the public will suffer if these regulatory reforms go into place. And what we saw with the advent of the DOL rule, unfortunately for such a short period of time, but still, even in that short span of time, we saw the lie being put to these horrific claims that the industry could never adapt, that advice would be too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Robo advisors, technology solutions of, 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 of several different varieties uh, we're, we're part and parcel of that, but it really is the larger point that that all the fear mongering is just that, and 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 it's important to be keenly aware that this undergirds a lot of industry's resistance, and it's phony at, at heart. All right, so we have uh, 30 minutes, so we can uh, open up uh, to the audience for Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. I have been a financial advisor for 20 years, so I've seen a lot of the, I've seen 20 years worth of regulations change, and I was so excited with the fiduciary rule because I'm in an industry that is dominated. Average age of a financial advisor is about 55, 56. It varies and predominantly um, white males. And when I'm in trainings or just out and about doing my financial advisor uh, checkups, <laughs> the, the language, oh my God, I'll have to meet with my clients every year. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, you know, how am I supposed to live without a 7% commission? Um, those of us who use this fiduciary standard were so excited, and we're also let down um, as financial advisors that the rule was killed or you know, shifting over to the uh, less by the SEC language, but I just wanna say thank you. Keep up the good work. I was hoping that a lot of those guys would just give up and retire. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were too. Many, many did, many did, many did. Um, and the ones that stuck in there have, uh, they're right back to the same, you know, battle days. So please thank you. Keep up the. Keep well, I mean, the that's pressure. an imp important point that, as I said, it wasn't just the robos who were supportive of this rule. There is a community of advisors out there who embrace their fiduciary obligations who argue for a stronger interpretation of the Advisors Act fiduciary standard than the SEC adopts, you know, who take seriously their obligation to avoid conflicts of interest, to manage the remaining conflicts of interest to the best interest, in the best interest of their customers. So we greatly appreciate those of you in the, in the profession who, who live up to that standard every day. I, I know. You know, I, I feel for you having to compete in an industry against a bunch of cheaters. 
And that's why it's not fair. And I think that is, um, you know, why uh, it makes a lot of sense that people who are trying to do the right thing, who are doing the right thing, want to have a set of rules so that everybody's doing the right thing. Because it does make it really hard for financial advisors who are giving good advice in their client's best interest and charging a fair price to compete against somebody who's lying about what they're charging, lying about what the person's going to pay, um, and giving bad advice. That When you are making stuff up, you can make it sound a whole heck of a lot sexier than when you're actually telling the truth. <laughs> Is this on? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, I'm one of those people she was talking about. I've been in the business for 38 years. Of course, I started when I was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'd like to mention that uh, when I started out with Equitable 11 years, with Virginia, with MetLife, and decided to go as an independent broker, you're right on that the broker dealers had the contests, had the quotas. In fact, they even went to proprietary products so that we would have a choice of going outside of MetLife, outside of Equitable. But they still had your best commissions on the products that they pushed, even if it was for lunch and learn. Now. I'd like to mention also that prospectuses is very difficult for people to understand, and that's something that needs to be rewritten. <laughs> and also, uh, my question, uh, when you had mentioned that, that uh, people stay with the companies they've retired, that's an advantage and a disadvantage, and especially with the city of Detroit <coughs> that went into bankruptcy and all of their 403B plans went down the tubes. But my concern is, and maybe you can help me with this, the, I understand that it would have been much more arbitration with the DOL as far as advisors were concerned that we would have to up our ENO coverage. So I'm wondering exactly how that arbitration thing would work. Thank you. So I can jump in on that one. So the DOL rule simply affirmed the, the standard on arbitration that exists under the securities laws, which was that um, they permitted, as the SEC and FINRA permit, brokers to include pre-dispute binding arbitration clauses in their contracts. Um, the, there's, I mean, I think the argument that, that, arbitra that, that arbitration would go up is, you know, that the number of claims would go up was unfounded, like many of the claims. So first of all, the primary claim brought in FINRA arbitration today against broker-dealers is violation of fiduciary duty, even though theoretically brokers don't have fiduciary duty. They're being held to that standard under common law fiduciary standards already. To the degree that the DOL rule was successful in causing firms to rein in all of these toxic incentives that encourage and reward advice that is not in customers' best interests. There would be a lot fewer incentives for bad advice. There would be fewer um, of the kind of problem practices that land people in arbitration. So I actually think the there is a reasonable argument. We won't know because we don't have the the case histories to study, but there is a reasonable argument that it would, had it been embraced by industry, it would have decreased their liability exposure rather than increased it. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, the argument about, uh, the fear mongering, I guess, really, about increased liability, uh, uh, arbitrations, and so forth, stem partly from what the DOL did in trying to create a remedy, a meaningful remedy, for the IRA owners. And the idea was, look, if you're an advisor to an IRA owner under this rule and you want to charge commissions, you may. But then you have to enter into a contract which says, I'm a fiduciary. I will look after your best interest. And if you breach that contract, then the IRA account owner has a right, uh, as, he, as he or she absolutely should, to hold that advisor accountable. That's what spawned this notion that there's going to be an explosion 
uh, of, uh, of claims, if you will. But for reasons that, that Barb said, it, that underlying premise was bogus. And to the extent that there really was going to be uh, you know, more claims and liability, it was going to actually uh, reform practices, and it was going to make injured investors whole. So it was, it was a win-win from our standpoint. So I just wanted to address the issue about rolling over a 401k or a 403b, and of course you brought up the city of Detroit. Um, you know, I gave the example of the federal TSP because I don't think the federal government's going bankrupt anytime soon, and if it does, we got some big problems that go beyond retirement savings. Um, but, uh, and so I thought that that was a really excellent example of a secret shopper, but if you want a broader study, in 2011, uh, the GAO uh, did an investigation where they called around and asked for advice, and the, uh, most of the call centers recommended a rollover without getting any specific information about the fees they were paying, where the money was at, what their circumstances were. Um, uh, another, about uh, <coughs> roughly half of them said that, oh yes, you could roll over because we have free IRAs, no fee, free, um, and talked about, uh, had no, you know, without clearly explaining any kind of investment transaction or other fees would still apply. They simply emphasized that their IRAs were free uh, or had no fees with a minimum balance. So it's that kind of misleading advice that I was referring to. Um, it is, you know, not everybody should leave their 401k where it is, but I think people are encouraged to roll over uh, much more than is in anyone's best interest. And those weren't fly-by-night operations. Those were the big providers who were engaged in that conduct. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Dana Muir from the Ross School. It seems that some states are with you in believing the SEC is not doing enough. Do you think states will make some progress here, or will the SEC rule preempt all of the state's efforts? Excellent question. Um, there, are, there are two things that happened recently at the, on the state, in the state arena. One is that the Association of State Regulators <laughs> sent a letter to the SEC, this is a bipartisan, reflects the bipartisan makeup of the you know, state governments, to the SEC arguing that unless it strengthened and clarified its, exist, its proposal, it was simply going to perpetuate the problems that they see every day at the state level. They're, you know, they're very concerned about the inadequacies of the SEC proposal. There are a few states that have decided to step in and see if they can adopt laws at the state level that would um, provide protections for their citizens that, that are not provided under, they don't believe would be provided under the SEC standard. Nevada is sort of out ahead. There was a legislative solution there. New Jersey um, is going through a regulatory process. They've had some hearings. We don't know what they're gonna propose. New York did something targeted at insurance, you know, at annuities and, and insurance type investments that's currently in court. I think there are two things that'll determine whether we see more, oh, and, and Maryland has a legislative proposal but hasn't been acted on. There are two things that I will deter think will determine whether we see more of that. The first is, will the SEC improve its rule. Because if the SEC were to step in and fix some of these key shortcomings, I think the, step, the states would be happy to step back and defer to a strong uniform federal standard. The other thing is whoever goes first is going to get sued. You know, they're going to face exactly the same kind of legal challenge that, that uh, DOL did. The, the law in question uh, in the securities arena is NISMIA, the National Securities Markets Improvement Act, which includes some preemption of state authority, but it's actually quite narrowly drawn. It's mostly to deal with those kinds of things like capital standards and whatnot that are logically set, best set at a uniform federal level, and specifically in preserve state authority to regulate broker-dealer conduct. One area that is preempted by NISMIA is uh, states are preempted from, from creating books and records requirements 
that are not required under federal law. So the, the industry would argue, will argue, that they can't, even if the state doesn't explicitly impose books and records requirements as a part of their rule, and they won't, you know, they're smart enough to avoid falling into that trap, the industry will argue that it is implied that in order to comply with the, the law, they have to create these books and records. I think there are flaws in that argument. One, there's actually already fairly extensive documentation requirement under know your customer and suitability rules that you could use for this purpose. The other is that there's no end to that argument. Like if you can argue that anything that you might do to comply is, is by definition reason to preempt the law, it, I think it sort of overwhelms the argument. So I think the states would have a strong defense, but this hasn't previously been litigated. And I think the DOL had a really strong defense and we you know so we we've seen <laughs> what can happen in the court system but i think those you know will if if one if a state per, perseveres gets challenged and wins a good decision in court then i think you'll see more states um step in if the sec doesn't adopt a stronger standard spot on Good morning, my name is Terry Friedline. I'm from the School of Social Work here, and uh, my question is about the regulatory floor. Um, so you've mentioned technology a bit, and I think um, technology increasingly um, creates you know, more complex tools for wealth accumulation. And you know, pensions, 401ks, retirement planning, um, you know, are some opportunities for wealth accumulation that are um, too often available uh, to you know, most people that, that live in the country, uh, you know, that's a it's a financial product and a, and a service that uh, you know really isn't widely accessible. And uh, with added technology, um, it relies on institutions to generate that wealth um, that's mostly ensconced uh, into the accounts of white wealthy investors, and I think can contribute to the racial wealth divide uh, that we see is expanding. And I think uh, this panel and the, and the panel earlier, um, you know, have been talking about, uh, you know, the regulatory floor. Uh, and I'm interested from your perspectives um, how that floor can really be cemented. So, you know, hopefully not just thinking about the bare minimum, but, uh, you know, really like a, a step above a floor that is really solid and stable and is expanded so that more people are standing on it. So I'll jump in first. So before I came to CFA Low these many years ago, I was on the board of the Denver Food Bank Coalition. So I worked on helping people get through emergencies with a basic amount of food in the middle of the Reagan recession. And then I went to CFA to work on how to make rich people richer by protecting them from abusive practices. Because when I started in 86, this was not a middle income issue. You know, I think that, you know, working on investor protection issues at most, you're dealing with about half the population. You know, like something like, isn't the median amount that people have saved for retirement zero? Um, I can't protect someone with no retirement savings from abusive practices in the retirement market. I think there is a whole set of things we need to be doing to rethink the way we fund people's retirements, to rethink the way we provide people with adequate income to live on in their retirement years that shouldn't expose them to these abusive practices. And it's not, it's not my area of expertise, but I think it's a, it, it, and I have, like, you probably know, so I speak with this just with a fair amount of passion. I have devoted 30 years to it. It is a far more problem impressing problem to figure out how we are going to help people live a basically decent standard of living in retirement than making sure that, you know, rich people don't get ripped off. But this is increasingly a middle class problem. We haven't, it's not a low income problem, but it is increasingly a middle class problem because this is now how we, we fund retirement accounts. So we're increasingly seeing people with, um, you know, 
with much more modest means being brought into the system. So I don't, I don't feel like I've answered your question, but that's the perspective that I bring to those issues. Yeah, I think, uh, Barbara, I share a, a lot of, of that perspective. So the, the reason I think that uh, this conflicted advice issue has become so salient is because the middle class increasingly rely on their retirement savings to fund their retirement. So, uh, you know, a, a much smaller portion of middle class baby boomers will be relying on some kind of pension and instead will be relying on what they saved. Um, so, we're no longer talking about transfers among the rich <laughs> when it comes to, uh, to conflicted advice, but we're talking about transfers from the middle class to the rich, yeah. and this becomes a bigger, I think, more pressing social problem. Mm -hmm. But there's another social problem, which is that we do not, we have an, an, a retirement savings program that is tr designed to bolster the retirement savings of the most well-off. And that doesn't have to do with conflicted advice. That has to do with the tax preferences that we have set up for retirement savings. So, you know, we fund retirement savings through giving, you know, essentially a matching grant to people who save for retirement. And that matching grant is a function of your highest marginal tax rate. So you're, if you're rich, you get the biggest grant. And if you're poor, you get zero. That's our retirement savings plan. And that's terrible. And so I think we... We even know not only is it terrible because it's putting mo as you know more federal dollars towards uh, rich people's retirement savings, but it also actually doesn't really work. So if what we're trying to do is spend tax dollars in order to increase retirement savings, we know that tax preferred accounts is like the least effective way we could do. We need to be incentivizing people on the margin. We need to be incentivizing people who don't have any retirement savings. We do not need to be doing dollar for dollar matching of the very richest people. So that's a, a different issue than conflicted advice, but very much a real one. Well, one just, other oh, oh, quick point is we have a system in a country where m a majority of people can't come up with $400 to get through an emergency, relies on them to take money out of their paycheck to fund their retirement. How effective do you think that works for that portion of the population? Yeah, I mean, you know, Barb and Betsy are absolutely right that um, our retirement savings problem sort of extends, you know, beyond conflicted advice. And, um, you know, we sort of have an institutionally terrible system. Um, sort of one kind of moderating fact, and it's not fully moderating, but it's, it's just the fact that, you know, for a lot of middle class households, um, you know, their homes um, provide, you know, some element of retirement security. And so even if they may not have assets, you know, they, they still have their house. But of course, that's, you know, fraught with a lot of challenges and risks and, um, you know, different uh, populations build equity in their homes at different rates sort of depending on how they're able to time the cycle and we know that you know the availability of credit is pro cyclical and so you know who gets access during boom times when returns are low um, you know it's, it's low-income people um, who are sort of like swapped in and so um, you know there, there are a lot of challenges and problems with that but you know for a lot of people who don't have access to pensions and you know um, DC plans and um, <clears throat> other employer-based uh, savings, um, you know, they have their homes, and, and that's also part of the, the challenge in sort of, you know, helping households build a secure retirement is that it had, the, the solutions have to be really, really multi-pronged. I, I will, it just, that reminds me about what I think is the most ironic thing about the regulatory environment around retirement right now, which is that at the time that, you know, the DOL rule is being vacated, the current administration also decided to vacate the DOL um, guidance, which said states could start to set up retirement plans for people who didn't have them through their employer, and they didn't need to worry about the ERISA fiduciary standards. So all of a sudden, like the current administration, super concerned about fiduciary standards, if we're talking about a state trying to give access to retirement savings to poor people, just not so concerned about people getting it through, uh, through financial advisors. Why the apparent difference of opinion? Well, because a lot of uh, you know, the financial services industry thought that they would lose out to these state plans and it would be the state plans would divert profit from them to the states. So the, the view on where the fiduciary duty seems to be 
always sides with is the financial services industry going to make more money or less money off this and they go in the you know whatever direction means more money for financial services turns out financial incentives matter <laughs> who knew <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna now raise a very sad, really sad uh, topic, which was uh, the MyRA product, which some of us worked on, <laughs> which is now defunct. Um, and in fact, I'm reading about it, it looks like those who had MyRA accounts have been rolled over into a Roth IRA with uh, the private firm Retirement Clearinghouse LLC. What did we do wrong? What could we have done differently? And is the government potentially this new anchor by which we are trying to enable those half of Americans who have no savings as a starter retirement product? Mm -hmm. Starter savings product. This was actually one of my biggest criticisms. We're talking about retirement to people who have no concept that they were ever reach retirement. It's a highly aspirational for a lot of people. Should we have even thought about renaming it and calling it something different? But generally the idea of using the federal government, not to mention your point about the auto enrollment programs at the state levels, but using government as not only thinking about the tax changes that would be warranted to make this more equitable, but government as a way to anchor, facilitate savings for at least the sort of mid to longer term. So, so, I mean, what we did wrong is we lost an election, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but beyond that, I do think there's a fundamental flaw in all of these approaches, to go back with, with what we were talking about before, that rely so heavily on people coming up with the money to save, coming up with the money to save now for retirement that they can't, imagine getting to and there may well be some different messaging that you can do around that that um, helps with that I uh, CFA has a program that we um, sponsor is called America saves it's designed to get low and moderate income people to save and build wealth uh, identify a goal set a plan save for that plan and a tremendous amount of thought has gone into the development of messaging in that. How do you, how do you encourage people to, to do that? Um, so I recommend it as if you're interested in seeing a sort of program out there that can be effective. But I do think there's a fundamental problem it, as long as we restrict ourselves to thinking about this in terms of how are we going to have, have people who don't have enough money to fix a flat tire if they get one start saving toward retirement. It's not gonna work. Yeah, and if I could just sort of pick up on that a little bit, I think um, we've learned just, you know, based on sort of better data and better measurement over the last, you know, few years that, um, you know, people, households have, um, face a lot of month to month volatility in their income. And their forced order challenge sort of beyond, you know, like planning for retirement and how great life is gonna be and like the golden years is just like managing through that like sort of volatility. And, and to me, that's sort of like the, the basic, you know, sort of first order problems. Like how do you, you know, help households budget so that they don't have these like financial emergencies and sort of have this, you know, um, you know, liquid savings or some buffer stock savings that they can top tap into for emergencies. And, you know, and, and, and that's some combination of, you know, policies and budgeting tools. And, you know, certainly there's a role for technology um, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I don't see us really cracking like the retirement nut until we sort of solve that basic budgeting issue. I, I applauded, you know, the ambitions associated with that program. But I had a lot, you know, the concern is that low-income people that actually need the money right now and if they don't need it right yeah 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 right um yes um but low-income people um you know there is this whole issue of trying to get people to save not for retirement but for the rainy day which we know is coming and so i do think thinking about products that um that help you know, as Jane just said, learn to budget and learn to save is the first place to go. And then I think we really do need to to rethink, like, what do we need 
who needs what to top up Social Security? Because some people don't need a lot of additional savings in addition to Social Security if we have a robust enough Social Security system. So some of these reforms have to be thought about in terms of that broader picture of how are we how are we managing retirement savings? How much are we spending on it? How much of it is going through tax preferences? And how much of it is going through uh, Social Security spending? Yes, hi. Uh, just wondering, what role do you uh, feel the educational community should play going forward in facilitating financial literacy in general? So this is actually sort of if I, when I retire, my new pet project. <laughs> Um, the leading cause of dropouts in Colorado, where I live, and I live in a town with a 35% high school dropout rate, is that students can't get even a non-college prep diploma without passing algebra, and we can't apparently teach algebra so they can pass. So for a non-college prep high school graduate, couldn't we have a basic consumer finance math class teaching, you know, math concepts around percentages on loans? And I, I mean, so, which isn't an, so much an investment concept, but it's some of this basic uh, consumer literacy issues. And I think, at least in, I'm, at least in our school system in Colorado, and I'm sure there are others that do it better elsewhere, but <laughs> there's very little thought given to that. And by the way, it might have some added benefits because some of the worst victims in our current retirement system are teachers in 403B plans that are larded up with high cost annuities that are taking expenses that are so high they're eating up all of the potential returns. So we're taking people who are underpaid who are going into their own private savings to buy school supplies for their classes and then putting them in the pretty much the worst retirement system we have out there. So if we did engage the education community, maybe we get some side benefit there as well. Can I add one thing before we end? And, and th I think that the, the final sort of segment of this panel has been very interesting on some policy questions that go beyond just the fiduciary duty and so forth. And, and in consistent with Better Markets core mission, one thing that we, that we should always bear in mind is nothing is going to harm uh, investors, Americans at, at every level, especially at the low end, as much as uh, the kind of economic upheaval that came about in 2008. And it's a sober reminder that all of these problems, you know, require different policy solutions, but you can't really make any headway unless you ensure the stability, the fundamental stability of the financial system. And that's why we mustn't forget that lesson. And, and while we protect investors, we also have to fight against deregulation on the Dodd-Frank reforms. That's why it's so key. That's great. Can we acknowledge our panelists? Thank you for your time. <laughs>